thank you for joining us here today. This is uh, going to be a real outstanding treat and a very special occasion for us. So thank you to Professor Will Glover for being with us here today. We finally meet after months of email communication and we're so delighted that we could make this happen. And many, many special thanks to the Institute for South Asia Studies for being our partner in this organization together with the Berkeley Pakistan Initiative and the College of Environmental Design, Department of Architecture. We're really very grateful that we could all band in together to partner on this wonderful event. It's a special honor also to welcome our guests here. I think there are several scholars in the audience in addition to many friends from the community. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and um, a special welcome uh, to Dr. Milo Beach, who is here with us today. And it's really a very special honor. He is the grand scholar of Mughal and Rajput painting. And Saatchi has had a wonderful association with him from our very first days. And we remember that he is the one with his Padshanama talk when the exhibition was going around, uh, set us on a roll um, with his talk. And we have, this is this was what, about 18 years ago. <laughs> and uh, so we have a wonderful friendship. So thank you so much. He's a distinguished friend of Saatchi and delighted to welcome you today. Um, and uh, so the agenda for today is um, I'm going to introduce uh, Dr. Munis Faruqi, who in turn will introduce our scholar Will Glover. And then after Dr. Uh, Glover's talk, there will be a conversation between Dr. Faruqi and Dr. Glover, and we'll open it to the floor for Q&A. So uh, it's going to be a very exciting afternoon. We really rarely get an opportunity to explore the whole in depth. And so this is really a rare occasion for us. And uh, Sachi has been fortunate to have two back-to-back -back events. We had our last event was on the board from a scholar, Fulbright scholar. And this is a very special one with a very different flavor. So uh, the event really was an accident <laughs> that happened. We were researching the idea of cities and the theme of cities. and. Um, as we did that, uh, you know, we chanced upon all your wonderful research and um, everyone unanimously said, University of Michigan Scholar will blow her, so <laughs> we cannot let that event pass. So thank you to the Institute for South Asia Studies for all the challenges that they have today with three events back to back uh, for accommodating us. So thank you Punita, thank you to Sanjita, thank you Lawrence. And thank you, Devi Prasad, for all your hard work and uh, making this a reality. And uh, Dr. Munis Faruqi is a familiar figure to all of you here at Berkeley. And he's a, he's a great Asian Art Museum friend. And he has, of course, given us many wonderful talks and led workshops there at the Asian Art Museum. And I just saw your publication on cover, which highlights his book on the princess of the Mughal Empire. And I have to say, I learned a tremendous amount on the succession uh, theories of the Mughal dynasty through your talk when you were introducing your book. But he has provided many wonderful insights on the whole era of um, the Mughal dynasty, um, and especially dealing with uh, Akbar and John and um, um, and uh, Aurangzeb, and also the mystic Sufi Dara Shiko. And uh, he's also done wonderful uh, studies of interrelationships that existed between the Muslims and the non-Muslims at the time. And so we are really very fortunate to have all the insights, uh, special insights from Manis Faruqi. We've also co-sponsored many wonderful events here at uh, Berkeley. And I think we must have a special affinity for this Mughal era because uh, Dal Ripple was a very successful <laughs> event and uh, we've had the occasion to be here. So thank you for your warm friendship and for hosting us here. And uh, Dr. Faruqi will introduce you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kalpana. Um, good afternoon. It is afternoon. I have to make a note of that myself. Uh, again, I'm Munis Faruqi, and I am in the Department of South and Southeast Asian Studies. Uh, it truly gives me the greatest pleasure, and I mean the greatest pleasure, 
to introduce Professor Lugilava today. I expect you have heard me say this before, greatest pleasure. And I tend to use it quite free. I sprinkle it you know, at the beginning of introductions as a way of welcoming guests and welcoming them specifically to the hospitality of Burger. But this time is slightly different, insofar as I really, really mean it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcoming Professor Glover truly comes from the deepest recesses of my heart. Now, before you misconstrue this deep affection for Professor Glover, allow me to explain. We are extremely old friends. We go back uh, almost old. 20 years. <laughs> yeah, 20 years is old for me. About you. We go back almost 20 years, almost to the beginning of my career in graduate school. And what's remarkable in some ways about this friendship is not just its longevity, but also the fact that we are still actually friends. We've been there to be in the same room, which is quite remarkable for academics. The more they get to know each other, the more they tend to dislike one another. It's not true for the two of us. Um, there's lots to like about Professor Glover. There's lots to admire about Professor Glover. And since I'm a historian, and he's also now officially in the Department of History at the University of Michigan, I'll come back to that in a second, let me draw on three broad historical examples of things to admire about the great <laughs> Professor Glover. Number one, we all tend to smoke in graduate school, but there is no one I have ever met who didn't just enjoy smoking one cigarette at a time, but two at a time. <laughs> Driving around in the hall in an ac car with a chauffeur was never his style. Instead, was it a Harley Davidson? No, it was a Kawasaki. <laughs> a motorbike roaring through the old city of Lahore. That is Professor Glover. <laughs> All of us at some points have tried on those very dashing Pakhan caps. <laughs> Most of us don't look very good in them. <laughs> Professor Glover actually looks dashing. <laughs> and finally, and you're going to have to excuse me on this one, Bill. If you think his biceps look good, <laughs> you should have seen them 20 years ago. The man, the legend. <laughs> okay, jokes aside. Um, it really is a momentous day for us uh, here at the uh, institution, also at the initiative and the initiative itself, because Will is undoubtedly one of the smartest, most accomplished, and well-rounded people I know. Now, some of this may be linked to the fact that he's had a remarkable education and a remarkable set of meanderings, a BA at Stanford University in geology, then architecture and MA at the University of Washington, and finally architectural history, PhD at an institution, oh yeah, you see Berkeley. Yeah. <laughs> Berkeley Moment. After finishing up at Berkeley in 1999, Professor Glover got his first academic job at the University of Michigan, and remarkably, never left. Instead, he has meandered within Michigan itself, moving from architecture and urban planning to now an appointment, a full appointment, in the Department of History. So he is one of my cast now fully. Over the years, Professor Glover has been a prolific scholar. In addition to 11 articles on a variety of subjects, including Sikh temple architecture, urban writing on colonial Lahore, the emerging architectural profession in colonial India, the transition from villages to urban communities, and women, gender, and the colonial city. Professor Glover has written 10 reviews of various kinds and two books. The most recent one, co-edited with Kenneth Coleman in 2012 from the University of Michigan Press, is called Relevant or Obsolete, Rethinking Area Studies in the US Academy. Mm. The other, the prize-winning book, from 2008, called Making the Whole Modern, Constructing and Imagining a Colonial City, is in the words of one review, and I'm going to quote him here, sophisticated, thoughtful, deeply researched, 
It sets a high standard for writing on Indian urban history, and indeed on modern India more generally. Another calls it, and I quote him, a thoughtful, ambitious, and groundbreaking work. Needless to say, I'm really looking forward to Professor Glover's next book, which I believe he is close to finishing. Um, it is titled, at this point at least, Reformatting Ordinary Life, the Aesthetics of Modernization in 20th Century India. As you might imagine, Professor Glover has won many awards and fellowships and is frequently invited to speak at universities and institutions, but today he's here with us at UC Berkeley. <coughs> and on that note, today's talk is titled Learning from the Hall. Please join me in welcoming my colleague and dear friend, Professor William Glover. and all of you in the audience for making this trip back home in some ways um, possible. Um, take about 50% of what Muna said and divide it by another 30% and you get a better sense of who I am as a scholar. Um, I, I do feel very attached to this institution. Um, Professor Lawrence Cohen was, uh, taught me a book that I still read every year. Remember this one, the uh, uh, Raghra Bari? <coughs> um, read that first in your seminar. Um, and, uh, you know, my wife kids me. She said that, you know, when, when, when you asked me to marry you, you said you were from California. I actually grew up in Missouri. You know, but I, I, I kind of lied about my, um, my genealogy. Um, at any rate, thank you, Munis. That was hilarious and embarrassing, just as <laughs> you would expect from you. Um, <coughs> So I, I was actually, I think, probably discovered, um, I think, by Kalpana because of my work on the Horde. And um, I haven't been working on that city for many, many years. But this talk, this opportunity to address you today has um, given me the opportunity to go back and revisit some of that, some of that earlier research and put, try to place it in relationship to what I'm doing now, and which is, um, kind of where the title of the talk came out, Learning from the Whore. And I'll, I'll give you a, a, a better sense of that in a moment. I also have 35 pages of written text, which I've just now decided not to read. So I'm going to go extemporaneous. I feel like I'm amongst friends. Uh, it won't be quite as well polished as it might be if I was reading it, but this may be made me think on my feet a bit, and um, maybe that's the right way to repay your generosities. Um, Lahore has... Uh, been a sort of favored place for um, tons of people who you would never expect to, uh, to, to love Lahore. There's a fondness, a nostalgia for the city. Um, I, met, I, I met with this um, doing research in, in India, in Delhi. You meet a lot of people whose families migrated in 47 from Lahore. Tons of people nostalgic about the city, many of whom have never even been there, and yet they're still nostalgic about the city. So, I started to think about why that might be. Part of it, of course, is the antiquity of the city. Um, it's even though you can trace the history of, the, of Lahore back some 2,000 years or so, we're told um, it really became important under the sultans from Turkey uh, in Afghanistan who sat in Delhi, and then after them the Mughals. Um, Akbar built the Lahore fort. Um, it's a bit remodeled from when he did it, but he sort of re restarted Lahore uh, under his reign. Um, his son Jahangir is buried in Lahore um, in, a, in a tomb not far from his powerful wife Nur Jahan's tomb and her brother Asif Khan's tomb. Um, we have, of course, Shalimar Gardens, and I'm, some of my images are a little bit meant to be humorous, uh, so it's okay if you chuckle. Uh, we have Shalimar Gardens, uh, Shah Jahan's contribution to the city, and even Aurangzeb. Oh, well, and, and uh, Wazir Khan's masjid uh, in the actual Andarun Shahar, the, uh, the, the inner city, the old city, the walled city, these are all kind of terms for the same place, um, who was a, a, a Wazir in, in uh, Shah Jahan's court. Um, and even Aurangzeb, who spent most of his rule uh, elsewhere, running down the Marathas and, and being run down by them, um, contributed to Bacha Masjid, which I think is one of the most beautiful buoyant-looking um, congregational mosques ever, ever commissioned by the Mughals. 
So there's that, there's that bit of, the, of the, uh, the city that I think draws a certain kind of attraction. Um, by the 17th century, Lahore was famous even in Europe, again, amongst several people who've never been there. Um, Paradise Lost, it's a small reference, but Lahore, he's very proud of it. Milton references Lahore in, in his poem. Um, the the uh, Thomas uh, More's Lala Ruch, which is basically about one of the Mughal princes, I believe, um, is partially set in Lahore. Um, and this one, um, Le Roy de Lahore, uh, made uh, its, its uh, librettist, uh, Massime, a kind of a household name in Paris in the 19th century. It was one of the very first operas to be performed in Garnier's new opera building um, under the housemanization of Paris. Um, very, very tangled uh, uh, basic synopsis to the story. It's based very loosely on the Mahabharata, but you have all these Muslim people <coughs> running through it. So, um, so the Lord has been able to be detached from any kind of concrete uh, location uh, on the planet and used into used in other cycles of imagination and, and, and pleasure and desire. Um, there's also another part of Lahore, and I'm skipping uh, quite quickly here, across the Afghan uh, interlude, uh, across the 40 or 50 years when Lahore was the capital of Ranjit Singh's uh, Sikh kingdom in the, in the early 19th century, um, to the British colonial period. And oddly enough, there's something um, about the, the colonial era of the city as well that I think produces a kind of um, affect, affective relationship. It's not so much, of course, that people miss these guys, um, but there are a number of figures who are associated with Lahore, who Lahori's claim for themselves, even though some of them only lived in the city you know, very briefly or uh, went through it or studied there, um, and I'm thinking of the, uh, the literary city, people like Mohammed Paul, um, uh, Kishan Chander, uh, Fez Ahmed Fez, Sadat Hassan Manto, um, all of these famous figures who, who sort of have to be in any conversation about the city. Uh, or, or the artists, Amir um, Deshergil, um, uh, uh, Sabahain, uh, spent a lot of time in Lahore uh, as a young painter. Um, and these are, these are beloved figures as well. We can think of um, uh, Rudyard Kipling, who, was, who grew up in Lahore. Um, he was a cub reporter at the Civil and Military Gazette, while his father, John Lockwood Kipling, ran the Lahore Museum and also was the first principal of the uh, Mayo School of Arts, which I'll talk a bit more about in a moment. Um, political figures, Bhagat Singh. This is uh, Bhagat Singh hung in Lahore for um, killing uh, Saunders. Uh, a Britisher who mistreated Lala Lajpat Rai, who died shortly after he received injuries from him. Bhagat Singh, um, of course, an iconic figure across northern South Asia, <laughs> northern India. This is probably from India. It says, grow balls, India. And then, the, <laughs> the hook is, you know, of course, a, a pump from a gas pump. Um, so I'm not quite sure what's going on in that image. Um, Lahore was also the place in 1929 when uh, Jawaharlal Nehru stood up and said, we, we need total and complete independence from the British. And it was the first time that the Indian National Congress had announced that as a major um, uh, goal. So that was, the, that was the city, really, the colonial city that drew me um, back to graduate school, that drew me to Berkeley, um, and I was intent on writing the history of that city. Um, and when I wrote, um, there was a, a kind of interesting ferment going on at Berkeley at the time. Strangely enough, uh, located uh, in many ways over in the Department of Architecture, just up the hill here at Worcester Hall. Um, there were several of us going through training around the same time. People like uh, Preeti Chopra, who was my actual class fellow, my classmate. Um, she ended up writing on Bombay. Um, Shakti Chattopadhyay, who was a year or two ahead of me, wrote an important book on Calcutta. Um, Jyoti Hosagrahar uh, wrote an important book on New Delhi. And all of us were in this department where there was no specialist in South Asian history at all. We all worked with a, with a <coughs> man named Dell Upton, who was an Americanist, um, but flexible. <laughs> um, and I think, I think that 
this was in the late 90s, mid to late 90s. And I think what we were um, trying to do as an ethical and political stance uh, as scholars at the time, is something that perhaps sounds quite quaint now, and almost unnecessary of doing, which is we were trying to read, you know, indigenous agency back into the project of the colonial um, urban world. Uh, there was a sort of dominant narrative that we were trying to struggle against, which suggested that <coughs> British colonialism with its laws and its hygienic sciences and its modern urbanistic and architectural practices and pedagogies came in, rolled over whatever was there on the ground, and recreated everything in its own image. Um, and the only role left for Indians in the story was something to do uh, with resistance. You know, that they could resist it, but they weren't really in charge of leading any of those, um, those developments that made Lahore and other cities modern. Um, those, you know, take it or leave it, it's a simplistic goal it's in a certain sense now, 15, 20 years later, we've kind of gone beyond that. Um, but that's what we were up to. And the fu a funny thing sort of happens um, when you start actually studying uh, like a PhD student and going into the archives and riding around the horn on your motorcycle, suddenly that Lahore that maybe got me interested in the first place, that Lahore of uh, Sadat Hassan Manto, that Lahore of great Mughal monuments and um, and, you know, and by the way, I mean, the city is just absolutely copacetic to, to artists and writers and, and um, uh, musicians of all sorts. That Lahore recedes. That's not the Lahore that one finds when you're doing kind of scholarly research. And so part of the title of my talk and part of the argument in my talk today, um, learning from Lahore, that's one of the first things I learned. And, and I, I say this because those Lahoris who I bump into, who say, oh, you know, you know something about Lahore? Uh, did you know about Mantosa? You know, um, when they actually get around to seeing what I did with the research, they, they're a little bit disappointed. I think their city may or may, may, or may not be in that book. And that was, a, that was an education for me. Um, if I were to... If I was going to read some sort of local indigenous agency back into um, this long set of practices that constituted global or colonial urbanism, I needed to find some way of, of organizing that. And fairly early on, um, I discovered a kind of philosophical tradition, I, I think is the best way to put it, that we might, uh, we might define as a sort of environmental materialism, that was beginning to uh, uh, emerged both in the writings of, of Indian experts in, in charge with uh, doing alterations to the city and with British experts who were in charge of, of organizing it and building new components of the colonial city. And this was the idea that um, the material environment works on people's sensibilities, whether they want it to or not. It's a kind of uh, almost an unwilled action. And so I can give you the words of some of the earlier spokespeople with this kind of thinking. Um, the idea that, um, <laughs> that there was something active even in bricks and mortar. There was something about the arrangement of streets, about the kinds of arrangements of the interior spaces of the home that were doing more than simply uh, standing for kind of a geographical uh, uh, impediments uh, in, in air. <laughs> um, this is something I said uh, that, that has a long history. I'm not going to go into it. We can begin with the Scottish Enlightenment, probably. Um, it's, a, it's a really good place to, to start thinking about this tradition that I'm just broadly going to describe as environmental determinism or, 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 or materialism. Um, and as I said, it's not just coming out of British sources. By the, if, if Kingsley in 1857, the same year of the rebellion, could say, uh, you know, I don't know how much of a force this has, but certainly something, and it may even be incalculable, by the end of the 20th, by the end of the 19th century, um, that the efforts to calculate the, the the sort of magnitude of the effect on human morality, the effect on human um, dispositions, the effect on behavior, in fact, was beginning to be measured. 
codified, classified, rules were being determined, laws were being built on those principles. And they became the substance of, um, for one thing, art pedagogy, art and architectural pedagogy. So that was an interesting discovery, an interesting finding for me. Um, and, and once I had that sort of in mind, I could go out and look for further evidence of this. So I'm just going to take you through a couple of different contexts where I felt like a um, a kind of uh, concatenation of material and immaterial forces underlay the, the intentions behind a uh, kind of built project in the city. Um, and uh, B, I mean, I probably won't make the argument anymore beyond this. Uh, to me, that was a way of establishing um, a role for Lahori's in, in, the, in the colonial history of their city. One of the settings that I looked at is Lahore's uh, civil station. Um, this is a kind of rough map of the city. The old city, the Andarun Shaher, the walled city, is up at the top of the uh, image. That's actually a walled city. It's kind of the, it, it, it got built up over the 16th <coughs> through 20th centuries. Um, and then a, a, an area outside of that, which was at one point simply small hamlets, uh, little villages, that became the sort of central piece of uh, British Lahore. Um, it was originally called Donald Town, after Donald McLeod, uh, somebody who became a lieutenant, a lieutenant gover governor of Punjab. Um, but this is where all the key colonial institutions of knowledge and of rule were located, in a several square mile area. Um, and I thought, OK, certainly then, um, this would be the place to test my idea. So there were. Uh, all kinds of you know, key institutions, the high court, the, the, uh, um, eventually the, the, the legislative assembly building, the museum, the, um, the GPO, all kinds of institutional buildings that um, were, were certainly of the sort where the character of those buildings would be something seen as agentive. So once you've, once you've established the fact that there's principles about how the environment impacts you, you can actually change the environment to get a different set of outcomes. And, and that, that's, very, that's something I can you know, run right through the uh, sort of discourse that, that went into building this part of the city um, through sort of historical documents and, and demonstrate to you. So I thought, okay, so Mall Road, let's see you know, what, what's going on on Mall Road. The first thing to note is that um, Kind of right from the start, when the British got to Lahore, um, several of the key institutions were housed in old buildings, old Indian buildings, um, and particularly uh, mobile tombs. So the, the Civil Secretariat is an example of that. <coughs> the, the, accounting, uh, the Accounting General's Office is an example of that. Um, the Railway Office was located in an old tomb. Government House, which is where the Lieutenant the Governor lives, was located in an old tomb. There's the uh, sitting room in the actual tomb chamber of this house. And you know, strangely enough, even, even the Anglican church, I mean, this is the, the official church of England, is located in a, in a Mughal era tomb in Lahore. So for much of the 19th and early 20th century, not only did the civil station kind of look Indian, and then the institutions of rule were in, actually in Indian buildings with their own materials, their own styles, um, and their own site strategies. So right away, it begins to suggest that the civil station, this kind of center of colonial power, is already a complicated milieu. It's already got complicated architecture going on. Well, what about those buildings that were actually newly designed? Um, and there were a bunch of them. The town hall, um, the general post office, uh, Lawrence and Montgomery Halls, um, Atchison's Chief College, uh, the, the Lahore Museum, the Mayo School of Arts. Um, these are buildings, these are high-end, you know, high architectural buildings, heavily considered, usually granted to designers through a, a, a limited competition, but a, you know, an international competition. Um, these are buildings that um, were initially designed primarily by British architects, but over the end of the 19th and into the early 20th century, increasingly, Indian architects are involved in this. Many of them trained here. 
under um, Rudyard Kipling's father, John Lockwood Kipling, at the Mayo School of Arts, which began to teach architectural drawing. And part of Kipling's genius was to send his students out into the old city and tell them to learn the principles of beauty from local architecture, from local Indian architecture. Um, a couple of those architects became quite prominent. Um, I'm thinking here of people like Ken Hayalal, uh, who was the executive engineer in Lahore and responsible for the completion of several of the earliest big new institutional buildings in the city. Uh, a man named Gandharam, um, also an executive engineer who was eventually knighted um, by order of the, of the, uh, of the queen. Um, this man, Bhairam Singh, um, who not only was given the honor of the title of uh, uh, Rai Bahadur, but also enjoyed the patronage of the Queen herself um, at the um, Osborne House on the Isle of Wight, where he did a, a sort of billiards room in Punjabi Sikh uh, style. And eventually he goes on to become the uh, principal of the Mayo School of Art. Um, all of these men won multiple awards. All of them were trained in this kind of new architectural <coughs> pedagogy that was coming from Britain at the time and other parts of Europe. Uh, and yet it would be a mistake to think of them simply as carrying out a kind of colonial project. Um, part of the argument of my book is, and it's a longish bit, so I won't talk about it right now, part of my argument in the book is that once those techniques of design that were coursing through the syllabus of Kipling's Mayo School of Arts were learned, and what were they? Buildings are a reliable sign of their maker, that you can look at a building and tell a lot about the culture of the person who made it or the culture in which that building is immersed, if you don't know the architect, that they have subject reforming effects, that buildings have the power to shape your disposition, your moral, your habit, your, your habitus, um, and that um, in, some, in some ways, then that buildings are, stand for a kind of a representative of, of culture, and you can actually use them to steer things forward. They're not just simply reproducing uh, the social, they actually have an agentival agent role in producing newness as well. Those are, the, those are the lessons coming through the architectural pedagogy for people like uh, Bhairam Singh. Um, we can look at uh, projects then, as I did in the book, um, where this new fairly powerful set of practices um, can be directed towards ends that were totally antithetical, let's say, to the, to the colonial project. So we can look at the DAV College, um, designed by Pairam Singh in Lahore, um, where uh, you know, the, 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 this is the key college for the Arya Samaj, which was an anti-nationalist kind of Hindu reform civil society organization. There's kind of a lot of words there, but um, whose uh, founders and principal, you know, the key movers and shakers in the organization were fundamentally anti-colonial, including Lajpat Rai, for whom uh, uh, Bhagat Singh uh, martyred himself in revenge. Um, and they, part of their pedagogical program was to look at the Vedas, look at the old starting with the Rig Veda, the oldest kind of Sanskritic text of the Vedic Brahmanical religion, and plummet for its, you know, its relevance in the current moment, and this maelstrom of change that was colonial society at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and so it's not surprising you know, that various sort of architectural features from a traditional Hindu um, repertoire, temple architecture, emerge as important features on this building, which I want you to see as nevertheless fundamentally modernist. This is a fundamentally modern, high-end building. It's full of all kinds of uh, you know, uh, cultural charges. It's, it's, it's technically extremely sophisticated. Um, it's, it's a building in a kind of architecture that became available to a very broad group of people in Lahore and, and during the colonial period by the 20th century. So to think about the colonial city as simply that place where the British had their way, where they sort of stamped out their symbolic um, identities <coughs> through architecture without counting any, any sort of contribution from um, Lahori residents, um, that was one of the places where I could start to make an argument against that. Perhaps more significantly and more importantly, um, these sorts of changes were not um, limited to 
the handful of uh, big, powerful buildings along Mall Road, which early in the 20th century began, uh, there used to be a, a, a famous phrase about Mall Road that said, Mall Road is the most beautiful road in Europe. You know? <laughs> it's kind of interesting to think about the, the um, ellipse there. Um, Buildings in this part of the city also began to uh, be altered in the, in, by the late 19th century and into the early 20th century. That's the Badshahi Mosque up on the top of the image, just to let you orient yourself. Um, somebody flew an airplane over the whole in 1933 and left these wonderful photographs. <laughs> I don't know who did it. Um, traditionally, of course, uh, the Indian house in British discourse, British architectural discourse, uh, was the the locus classicus of Indian society? It was the inner realm. It was it was the you know the place where the heart is formed. Um, it's it's timeless in its uh, you know functionalities and um, the people who were responsible for making it, the mysteries and, and the tehidars who actually designed and built. There were no architects involved in this. Um, you know they were said to work basically through idioms of hospitality, exchanges of food, things like that. It was not a monetary exchange. There were no contracts involved in this sort of thing. Um, of course, a lot of bunk in that as well. Um, but what we see happening by the turn of the 20th century and, and some decades before that is the, the space of the home, um, even in the old city, being suddenly caught up in other kinds of discursive worlds, uh, sanitary reform. Um, the, the, the makers and, and, and sellers of a whole lot of household products. Um, uh, the, the sort of religious reformers who are talking about home life as a kind of key site for the application of new conducts. Um, um, and, what, and, and in this case, um, this is a sanitary primer um, written by somebody in Lahore. Uh, and they're simply showing you know, ordinary images from the old city of uh, in the upper one, a, a sort of attic where the people have left their rice out and the rats are like they get in there and cause play. And down below, um, you know, sort of the, the sort of haphazard storing of stuff and the filth in the street. Um, and on the upper right, all those things that say PR, PR, those are plague rats. How many plague rats were caught in the traps and that? So what's happening here is a very ordinary uh, environment, a very familiar ordinary um, Milieu is being brought into this new kind of discursive frame where um, you know, the principles of modern hygiene are being um, connected to it. Um, this over time begins to produce changes in that traditional abode, in that um, unchanging, timeless Indian house. Um, and I found this perhaps the most interesting part of <coughs> when I was doing my research. Um, what you get over time is um, a whole lot of people who, quite frankly, flunk out of the Mayo School of Architecture, uh, setting up their shops and um, doing plans for the city, doing plans for people. Um, by the 1920s and the 1930s, I don't think much earlier than that, but certainly by then, um, we see a state of what we might just call pattern books. These are books that are written, sometimes underwritten by concrete companies, because that's a new material coming out at the time. But usually there'll be some author who had studied architecture in Europe, come back and, and just give it a, a set of patterns for anybody who wanted to build, any homeowner who wanted to build a house of their own. Um, this is from one of those books. And um, what you can see, but, but you'll have to just sort of take my word for, uh, for now, is that the basic layout, the basic floor plan of the house isn't changing much from houses that we can document 100, 200 years earlier. But new kinds of words are being put on rooms. Rooms are becoming much more specialized in their uses. Um, and perhaps the biggest thing that's going on is that changes are occurring in the facade. Um, whereas it was a sort of uh, oft-repeated uh, complaint by revenue officials who were in charge of taxing houses and, and cities in the Punjab in the 19th and 20th centuries, that you cannot tell the status of a person by the size of their house. Sometimes rich old traders are living in hovels, whereas you know, people who've fallen on very hard times are inhabiting bat-like, these huge mansions. So, so this, the status of the house, the exterior appearance of the house, have very little indexical relationship to the status of the occupant of the house. Um, this is, to my mind, a text that's 
really working to 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 refine and, and sort of um, give us a, a, a typology of what what a house can say about its householder. So houses in this book are designed, intended for well-to-do gentlemen, for the Uparwale Bajeki families, uh, a palatial bungalow intended for the Raisa class. Um, on the on the other side, um, these are the sort of adjectives being um, stuck onto the designs in the pages of this book. This is a book that's written uh, both in Urdu and in um, uh, English, and as I said, it's it's um, supported by a concrete company. <laughs> um, and this, over time, this is kind of this is the new architecture of the Wall City. This house would have looked damn modern, you know, uh, at the time of its construction. It's got great big windows, um, which were never there before, and that's having to do with the ways in which the home space is is tangled up in in uh, hygienic discourse, right, about having sufficient light, having sufficient air and, and ventilation in the house. Um, above the windows are things called chandans, which are these vent ventilating apertures. Um, this is the kind of thing um, that both announced something that was up to date um, and, and running the house properly. Um, and in that sense, you can think of this kind of change to the ordinary architecture of the city as part of a way in which you know, even family interests were being um, advanced in the colonial milieu. The newly reworked house was simply a, a piece in um, what became much larger agglomerations of houses, new kinds of neighborhood forms um, developing in the city by the 1920s and 1930s. Um, on the right is Model Town which was planned and built beginning in the 1920s, late 1920s, by a group of mostly retired municipal officials, Indian officials in the city. Um, and on the left, the place it was meant to really replace, um, that's the old city, that's the under and it's the one that these are both taken from 4,000 feet above uh, ground. So you can see they're the exact same scale. And right at that place where, you know, by the 19th century, even in England, uh, Angles and others were telling us, like that dense, crowded inner city, um, that's removed and replaced with what? A park, right? So, um, a very up to date idea underlying the planning of uh, Model Town. Um, it derives absolutely directly from this gentleman on the right, Ebenezer Howard, um, who was a clerk, but towards the end of his life uh, became an investor in a series of schemes for what he called Garden Cities in England. Um, Garden Cities becomes an international movement by the 30s and 40s. It's now probably, you may have heard about it here, uh, it's not unlike the uh, New Urbanist movement. They all think of Howard as their great-grandfather intellectually. Um, Howard was not a designer, uh, nor an engineer, and yet in his book from 1902, um, illustrating his Garden City idea, he drew a kind of circular city with a garden in the middle, <coughs> radiating streets, a shopping avenue running right down the middle. And you know the, the, the schemes in England that Howard himself was attached to as a, as a developer later in his life have nothing of this kind of formal regularity that, that Model Town's founders decided to, to plan Model Town upon. So you can see directly um, a group of people borrowing a very up-to-date model um, from the British, we can say, at a certain level. Um, I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, but turning it to their own ends, and in fact it looks far more, uh, there's far more fealty here to Howard's original idea than Howard ever would have tried on his own. And that's interesting, right? And in fact, I found a quote from a, a woman who lived in Lahore um, in 1908, some years before this, uh, Model Town was built, um, who said, you know, I can't imagine what would happen to uh, Indian culture with, were we to, you know, raise their homes and give them some sort of new town uh, settlement instead, you know, wouldn't Indian culture go away, or at least its crafts, right? Um, so the idea that someone's living in this kind of modern plan, um, modernist space, if you will, um, with its decentralized um, civic institutions um, and shops, um, seems fairly commonsensical to, a, to a, a person at the turn of the 20th century. And then if you get Prakash Khandan's memoir, 
Prakash Pandyan, who you know, lived all over the Punjab, but he wrote a book called Punjabi Century. And he talks about, in the 40s, living in a house in Model Town, his father's house. And he talks, mostly emphasizes the kind of traditional ways that people were still living their lives. So he says, men went out for walks early in the morning, which is something that people repeatedly commented upon uh, in the old city. Women and men walked separately. Um, and though there was a, 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 a men's club and a women's club in Model Town, there was no quote-unquote club, club life uh, uh, to speak of in, 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 the, in the settlement. Uh, instead, the only social events he remembers going to were weddings and head shavings. And in fact, it's only his wife, who's Swedish, um, Gar is her name, it's only her who has a problem with this kind of geometrical world that she's now living in, in her father-in-law's house. And it, it expresses itself because she's really um, annoyed by the way her father-in-law sets the furniture out in these perfectly grid-like patterns in the living room. And every night she messes it up. And it's the old servant who puts it back every, every, every day, every morning for her. Um, so at any rate. So this is Lahore um, in 1930. Um, this is the Lahore of uh, affection and nostalgia that I began with. My story doesn't touch on those people very much. And so one of the things I mentioned earlier that I learned from the Lord was um, something about uh, the need to reconcile um, nostalgia, imagination, with a kind of bricks and mortar. And one of the ways in which I began to work on that and resolve it for myself was through this exploration of environmental materialist traditions in the city. Um, a good friend of mine said, Hey, I liked your book, but you know, you wrote this book about an entirely huge, important city, and I don't think the word capital appears in pages anywhere. And I said, okay. And, and a graduate student was kind enough to, uh, to to put in print that I got Foucault wrong. You know, so that's another thing that happens when you write a a, 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 a scholarly book is that you get all kinds of lessons from the outside. But it was really the comment about capital. Um, that, that made me start to think in a different way. Um, and this is that while I was documenting changes to the inner city architecture in the, in, in, in the Andalusia Shahara, huge transformations were going on in the countryside just outside the city. Um, there was a massive um, a perception of a massive uh, debt problem amongst the agriculturalists in the Punjab at the time. So much so that um, people were fearful that, uh, that agriculturists who would usually give their land as a lien on a loan would lose it and default the land into the hands of the money lending class, which was always rendered as rural, as, as urban, rather than whether or not they actually were. Um, and so there was legislation passed in 1900 which disallowed you from selling agricultural land to anybody except. The, the traditional agriculturalists in that area. Um, so there was that sort of perception of crisis going on. Uh, there was a perception of crisis that the most fit and talented young men, mostly, of the country um, were leaving the, uh, the villages in droves to take up more interesting careers, either in the government or by going to college in cities like Lahore, um, and that there was something like a brain drain going on out in the countryside. Um, there was a pretty clear two-tier migration pattern, landless laborers on the one hand and the sons of the gentry on the other. Um, so we're told, and I'm told as an urban historian all the time, usually in the introduction to a book that I'm reading, that you know, cities exist in a hinterland. They're not simply uh, defined by the municipal boundaries. Um, it's rare, and I challenge you, maybe I'll get some good ideas from you today, to find a text that actually takes that connectivity seriously. And my current project is to think about the changing nature of interconnectivity between cities and, and villages across the long 20th century. Um, something about Lahore um, remains in that work. Um, it should be said that until probably the turn of the 20th century, maybe not until the 1910s or so, the village and the city were seen to have very little, in fact, to do with one another at all. Um, they were seen as separate, uh, immiscible, um, one being a sort of bed of tradition, the other a place where uh, caste, uh, you know, caste nobility was part of the, part of the deal. Um, by the 
tens, 1920s. This is probably a, a, one of the effects of World War I and, and India's massive participation in, the, in both of the big European wars, world wars. Um, we begin to get people thinking about the city and the village being on some sort of a continuum. So by 1926, um, rural sociologists have coined the term urban, which is you know, a kind of hybrid of rural and urban. Um, the rural-urban continuum, um, I think that's around 1930s. And by the 19, late 1930s and 40s, you have this sociological artifact, really, the villager in the city, a kind of country bumpkin, if you will, in danger of going astray, not really aware of how to operate life in the city. Um, and this becomes a major focus of concern for urbanists. But what was interesting for me to discover is that these concerns connected rural and urban um, um, <coughs> context quite, in, in, quite, quite tightly. So um, just to give you a brief taste of some of the stuff I'm looking at, and I'll wrap up. Um, uh, part of what I found really fascinating um, is what really goes under the rubric of uh, uh, village uplift or rural reconstruction. Um, some of this stuff is well documented, some of it's not well documented. Uh, this is a scheme for a model village by a group called the Dehat Sudar, um, uh, uh, which simply just means you know, kind of rural uplift, if you will, or development. Um, there are more and less famous voices involved in this. There are anti nationalists and nationalists, um, and there, there are a range of kinds of projects that they did. Um, this is one that was done um, down in um, uh, Tamanadu, right? Bob? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, but probably by Bengali. Yeah, it, well, Spencer Hatch was part of this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, um, the YMCA mm -hmm. under brother, There's, this is a very recent web image. So some of these rural uplift schemes out in the countryside are still up and running. One of the figures that I've been kind of most curious about, and somebody that I think links us back in a certain way to my earlier comment about this tradition of thinking about the interrelationship of material and immaterial qualities, um, is this guy, Frank Lugard Brain. Brain was the first person to actually put village uplift um, into a, a kind of government model. Um, the local district boards was a sort of institutional um, site for, for this work. He is in the 1930s, I believe, he's, um, he's made the, the Minister of Rural Reconstruction in Punjab, which is a post that other provinces eventually also um, begin to fund and staff. Um, and it's the kind of affect that he brought to his uh, reconstruction work that's really fascinated me. And I think it's, there's some sort, of a, some sort of a connection between the urban stuff that I was learning and what's going on out here. Um, I mentioned this idea of um, uh, that, that, that the most talented folks in the countryside are, are the ones who are leaving in droves. This is, of course, bodes very ill for a, a major part of the Indian economy. You need good agrarian um, profits and surpluses out there. If you think about all the many ways that cities and countrysides are connected, um, one of the really interesting ones is that almost all of the revenue in the, in the colonial period and before that as well came from agricultural produce. So the nature of your crops, the forecast for the next one, the harvest, how you did, would say a whole lot about how quickly cities got repaired, how quickly cities got extended onto labor markets and cities have always been tied to the harvest cycle, so forth and so on. So one of the things that um, Brain and others were most um, interested in doing was making the village a much more felicitous place for uh, an urban view. So he argues for the use of um, wrestling and um, uh, um, weightlifting schemes, whistling competitions, um, writing and acting plays together, um, group radio um, uh, programming, um, all, in fact, all of the sort of things that you would find um, by the 30s or so in an English village. And he, he explicitly says, you know, our villages with their tarmacs and wirelesses and bus service is every bit as urban you know, as most Indian cities. And what we need to do is to cultivate a kind of, um, a, a kind of ethic out in the countryside that would lead to you know, people locking on to what it meant to be a citizen. Um, I mentioned his affect. This is a passage from 
this book, it's much repeated, it's on several of the things he published, and he's got like 30 different books. Um, he apologizes at the beginning of his book. He said, some may find this book rude, you may find my um, discourse crude, but the rustic urban villager understands direct, frank stuff, and it's even better if you put a bit of humor in it. You know, so what do you require? Good crops and healthy children, why don't you get them? Well, basically you suck in all these different ways, right? Um, and so there's a sort of didactic, you know, salvation uh, going on here. Um, um, this is, of course, uh, part of a much bigger story about uh, kind of urban and rural sociology coming together at a, at a global scale in the mid-century, mid mid-20th century. This is a typical kind of uh, uh, sociologist from the 1960s. Louise Wirth, who you know, is a kind of theorist of urban anomie and, um, and urban sociology, he's, he's in all the textbooks in, at the Lucknow School of Anthropology in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. um, we have Indian figures like Radha Kamal Mukherjee who are contributing original research to that whole set of discourses about differences between the rural and the urban. Um, by the 1950s, we have a whole set of theories about uh, modernization that, that link rural and urban milieus together. And I, I, you know, as somebody who's interested in uh, the built world and in planning and design discourse, um, I find this stuff quite fascinating. Um, the community development schemes that India uh, still, to some extent, um, uh, funds um, began kind of uh, in 1948 or 1949 with Albert Meyer. Albert Meyer was a friend of Nehru's and he was an American um, military commander and I think an architect. Um, who uh, starts a number of pilot schemes out in the uh, countryside of Uttar Pradesh. And he, he, he develops this figure, um, this is not one of them, but he develops this figure of a kind of village, uh, a sort of village educator. And, and, and Meyer writes to his friend you know, one night sitting in one of these villages out in the UP, the model village, saying, you know, like, I'm interested in the in the, uh, the Bakra Dam, you know, that Nehruji showed me, and I'm interested in all these big infrastructure pro problems. But to me, you know, getting at the villager, getting at the heart of the villager, that's that's where you change the texture of life. Um, um, S.S. Nehru, who was a, I think, cousin of Jawaharlal, strange polymathic guy, wrote a book on um, how to increase your uh, your vegetable yields by hooking wires up to the plants at night. <laughs> That's a great drawings in that book. Um, um, this, is, this, is, this is the language, this, sort of, this language of affect. Um, the, the, the true rural uplift educator. That's that kind of village assistant, which, by the way, with 99% of the time a, a city boy, um, has to furtively watch, be born with them, die with them, thrust themselves into their own skin. Um, that, that's the kind of language that has uh, drawn me to this um, milieu. There were aesthetic principles that were fairly common and shared in, in a lot of this uh, village uplift and reconstruction work, one of which was uh, con consolidation, which was both a kind of metaphor for marshalling local talent and not letting it leak off to the cities, but also an actual description of land reformatting schemes. So this is a village uh, with its many uh, uh, irregularly shaped fields uh, prior to what was called a land consolidation project. Um, this is it today. If you want to do something fun, you can get on Google Earth after this talk and set it on slow flight, about four or five thousand feet above Punjab, and just go out. You see, all the villages have this basic look now. They're, all their fields are replotted into rectangles, and um, the village Abadi, that place where the village house is located, is usually surrounded by a ring road. The connecting arteries between villages are given some attention, um, and so forth and so on. Um, we get uh, architecture students in Delhi um, working on their thesis projects to both redo villages that had been abandoned in 1947 in the Punjab, and therefore needed to be reconstructed for a partition uh, for, to occupy uh, with new uh, residents. Um, and um, these sorts of, uh, uh, so this is the layout plan of an old building. You can see the cross uh structures are ones that are abandoned. Um, but basically, this is, this is 
town and country planning. This is modern town planning. Ring roads, neighborhoods, you know, segregation of uses, cows and people in different parts of the building, um, their class divided neighborhoods. Um, this is basically, and this is as far as I've gotten right now with this, and I don't, I'm not very happy with this, but it's kind of like a set of urban logics being extended out into the village. And, and, and I can show you some other um, examples of this. Um, the, at the level of the actual house, here too, we begin to see the same sorts of um, incorporation of, of the village dwelling into this new discursive field that's about hygiene, it's about standards of light and air, um, and, 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 and you know, the maintenance and keeping things up. Now I mentioned that some of the people doing rural reconstruction were um, real hardcore colonialists, anti-Congress, there's a lot of anti-Congress uh, reconstruction work. Um, but Gandhi, who's also, of course, did put his hand in this world quite a bit, um, when, you, when you get down to it, they begin to sound very much the same. So there's, there's something here to me that seems um, solid and, and, and in need of parsing. Um, by the 1940s uh, now, um, and so I think one of the very first schools of architecture in India was called the School of Town and Country Planning. Right? So town and country are joined together. Um, we have uh, Radha Kamal Mukherjee here, who was a long time uh, professor in Lucknow, um, wrote tons of interesting stuff, um, became extremely right wing, I think, towards the end of his life, um, and lived 90 some odd years, I think, um, planning the countryside, a treatise on, on, on joining these kind of uh, previously disconnected worlds. Um, here's, a, here's a plan. Uh, for an ideal village um, by uh, Sri Chandra Chatterjee, who, who proposed uh, a new school of, of rural planning uh, in Calcutta, right, right around Partish, right around Independence. Um, and he never really got, he didn't get by them, he didn't get funded. Um, but this is the kind of synthetic uh, schemes that are coming out by this time. Um, back to brain, town and country are parts of one whole, and so forth and so on. I think you get the general gist of it. And I, I think of this as something that is both a, a missing part of the story for urban historians. That is that there's a connection somehow between the city and everything else that's going on outside of it. I've just given you the kind of connections in the intellectual universe, um, and they're concrete ones. But this is very much on the, on the um, agenda for today in India as well. So at a certain level, we're thinking about a history of present. Um, this is a web a screenshot that I captured uh, yesterday on the Make in India website, Rinda Modi's just across the bay today, uh, talking to the ITs uh, about his plans, which include things like smart cities, rural urban integration. Um, down here it says integration of, ex of the existing buildings into new cities. Um, it's, it's, it's a discourse that's very much uh, on the table, um, and it's a discourse which makes me um, glad I spent some time in Lahore thinking about what was going on in the city, but also aware of the shortcomings of not looking beyond the municipal limits of that place. And I think that's my last slide. Thanks for your attention. I was wondering if you could talk about Chandigarh and whether Chandigarh is a logical extension of some of the ideas that were kind of percolating in Lahore uh, before partition, and then afterwards was Lahore uh, kind of the, the result of that. And, and could you talk about what the effect of, of patronizing and uh, architectural theories uh, from the West that are imposed onto India? I mean, why should a city like Chandigarh be modeled for, in, on a grid system for automobile trafficking when, uh, when most of the people in Chandigarh since the last time I visited there, don't have a car, and don't, and, and that's a sort of a, sort of a, it's an economic model that doesn't meet the reality on the land. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if in Donaldtown or in other places in Lahore, if that sort of, sort of those ideas of Le Corbusier or, or Frank Lloyd Wright uh, in trying to grid up a, a, a radial city into like sort of into some sort of ordered pattern for automobile traffic. If those things had unperceived uh, kind of consequences in the Indian or South Asian context that you could talk about, that's a big question. Um, so 
Definitely what was going on in Lahore had a direct impact on Chandigarh. As Chandigarh was meant to replace Lahore after 47 when Punjab needed a new capital. Um, and um, it was Nehru's explicit wish that it not be like an old uh, city like Lahore. Um, you get into this interesting problem of numbers, uh, and particularly in terms of the kinds of expertise that were available um, in the 1940s and 50s in these newly independent nation states. Um, there were just a handful of people who could plan a city in India in 1948. And um, originally, Chandigarh was planned by um, British and American um, uh, architect. Matthew Nowicki was one of the important ones, and Albert Meyer, who later does the community development scheme. Both of them are, I mean, I think Nowicki was maybe originally um, Hungarian, but an American um, immigrant. Um, the wiki died in a plane crash, and they suddenly didn't have anybody to complete the scheme, and, and uh, somebody said, I want to go to talk to Corbusier in Paris, and, and Corp said, yes, I'll do it. But I think part of what I was trying to say, looking at a place like Model Town, is that, you know, whether it's a grid, whether it's a radial plan, some sort of a formal geometric system has long been a feature of both rural and urban planning in this part of the part of the world, and you know, I was kind of being snarky by saying it's only uh, Tandon's wife who seemed to have a problem with it. Everybody else was living in it quite comfortably. So um, there is another bit, though, about Chandigarh that is much more um, kind of integral to what I'm thinking about these days, and that is that Chandigarh is a series of sectors. I don't know if you've been, but you you, you say I live in sector. Uh, 14, and, and then the next three numbers you give will tell somebody exactly where you live, right? Um, and that um, that sector plan was a piece of uh, kind of global um, planning culture by the 1920s. It's, it comes from an American named Clarence Perry. It's called the Plan Neighborhood Unit. And 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 uh, I had a doctoral student at Michigan, who's now a tenure professor. It makes me feel old. Um, uh, Sanjeev Vidyarthi has written really interestingly about that. And, and what he shows is that by the 60s and 70s, when you're getting like defense colony in, in, uh, in New Delhi, or you're getting all these extensions to, um, to the largest cities, they're all the neighborhood unit plan. And so it's a kind of typology that's just easy to sort of Xerox and, and put into, into place. And I think, you know, Part of what one has to think about, it you sound like you might be from the architecture or planning world, right. yeah, is that one has to begin to divest any certainty about the impact of any kind of formal uh, proposal. Because we can see that they can be used for so many different things. Mm -hmm. Lawrence. Uh, oh, sorry. Actually. Yeah. Okay, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Oh, hey, uh, thanks. Thanks for the talk. It was wonderful to revisit the images Thank you. Uh, on, a, on a large screen from Lahore. So I, I have sort of one question from a new project about thinking about the relationship between the city and, and the rural. Uh, could one think of it as a reciprocal relationship? And I'm thinking about using the metaphor of two mirrors forever reflecting mm -hmm. each other. And if we, especially if we are going to think about affect. Mm -hmm. And let's uh, let's say Street 420, the Raj Kapoor film, mm -hmm. which is about creating about this guy coming, this bumpkin coming from yeah. the village to the city, but under the shadows of the of the modern house, you have the village community being formed in the city. Right. So I wonder if we can think about this as more like a forever reflecting two mirrors, the city and the village. Right? I, I mean, I love that. That's an interesting thought. Right. I, I, I would want to, though, um, I want to hold out the distinction between the two. I actually think it's important. I don't think that by saying the um, city and the countryside are um, entwined, you know, inextricably, we're not saying they're the same place. So a mirror image to me is about repetition, and I think there's a difference there between the two but that nevertheless, you know, the idea that they have to be seen together is, is kind of where I'm working on it. Um, you know, the, the, the villager in the city, Raj Kapoor and Sri Charsal Peace, um, that's a leitmotif across the you know, middle decades of the 20th century. It still really works today. 
Um, and uh, one of the key kind of milieus that was developed to address this problem of mostly male um, migrants who were prone to drink too much, uh, prone to, you know, womanize, um, spend their money improperly, um, and, in, and eventually, because they had to live in the city, in the neighborhoods, they were a bad element. One of, the, one of the forms that was developed to address that was precisely Chandigarh, the new town, you know, the, the totally planned city that you, you could just completely cross off your list, cast imbalances, demographic imbalances, and things like that by planning a new town. But in the existing cities, um, there was an effort to recode um, urban mahalas, urban neighborhoods, by using the term of the village. And, and in fact, reproducing kinds of the um, self-governing institutional forms for village, like the, the panchayat. Um, you had an urban equivalent of that. That was something that was going on in the 50s a lot. Um, so, yeah, the, the status of the village in the city, um, you know, if you, they call them Lal Dorda villages because there was a red line of Lal Dorda drawn around them on the map because, at least in Punjab, because of this prohibition on selling agricultural land to anybody but an agriculturalist. So when these villages are surrounded by the city, you can't get rid of that property. But the rules are different in there. So there, there are factories, there, there are shops, there are workshops, there are garment factories, there, there are places for lots of you know, subaltern labor. They're not villages. You know? And so I think we need to hold on to the distinction and, and think through that. Think, think the relationships without losing the difference. Yes. Thank you, Chris, for the talk. Um, two quick questions. One, does uh, village uplift and land consolidation come to look different in Pakistani and Indian Punjab, and, the, and if so, why? And the second question is, is um, the extension agents and village uplift were being developed in many sites. Rockefeller was very invested in doing work in Latin America. Yeah. And a lot of these forms, especially with the emergence of the U.S. as a critical player, become in the 30s, but especially post-war, are being experimentally developed in Latin America. And there's, of course, at some point, present studies is is a Latin American project for the U.S. and, yeah. and there's an immense flow of expertise between Latin America right. and India, circuited through Rockefeller, etc. And right. are Latin American models conversations? Do they become part of these yeah. Yeah. new forms of of, of, of uh, yeah. time and kind of country? Yeah. Okay. So the, the first question: Oh, Pakistan, India, sort of yeah. post-independence. What's the evolution on either side of that border in this kind of work? Um, and I can't tell you, um, partly because it's so hard for an American to do research in Pakistan now. Um, it's hard to get visas, and, and you know it's easy enough to get a visa to go live in Islamabad, but if you want to go out and do field work, it's much, much harder. Um, some of it's documented, of course, so you could do archival work that would look at that question. So I'm not going to venture an answer there, other than to say that um, I am kind of in dialogue with some scholars of Pakistan who are working on small towns. And there, some of the findings are really fascinating. And it turns out that a lot of this con lands consolidation and new road infrastructures and whatnot that were being put in place in the 30s, 40s, 50s has made it perfectly um, easy to live in a small town or a village and commute into the big city. You go back at night, everybody's got a motorcycle. You know, and it, that, that's kind of interesting. You know, I don't think that was what was planned. <laughs> um, they, the global nature, particularly um, looking at examples in Latin America um, and the role of Rockefeller and UN and all the other sort of multinational agencies, um, is 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 very helpful to a project like this. Obviously, because I can sort of get what the what the canon is. Um, but my my feeling is we don't actually know what was going on yet very well, as scholars, what was going on in India. And it's precisely because our urban historians don't do it. Our agrarian historians do a better job. I mean, you read David Ludden's book on the agrarian history of India. It's this Cambridge history book, and it's just wonderful with all the ways he thinks. You know, he ends up saying on page 150 or something that, you know, cities were in agrarian space. You know, they were, they were just an agrarian function in a way. Um, but we really don't know that story, and I would, I would hesitate, I think just by training and instinct, to assume that, that there, there's a kind of universal type going on. Obviously, that's a very banal thing to say, but um, I, you know, India, 
all of us who work on South Asia and the academy have colleagues who say, why do you need four people to work on India? You know, you've got 95 people working on the United States and four on India. It's a big place. You know, it's like a lot of difference there. So I don't have a good answer to that question yet. But uh, you're absolutely right. This is not a, a discourse and a set of practices and pedagogies and financing structures that's limited to India, though in India, the village holds a very special place, right, culturally. David? Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I was really interested in this, um, the echo of the word uh, model. So, you know, model time, you know, also have model villages, but it seems that they're not exactly the same kind of model um, because there are many more villages that you're trying to influence through these kinds of schemes. So I was wondering if you could talk about the mechanism that's imagined. So is it, so for people like Meyer, are they trying to sort of set in motion a new uh, rural mentality that's then going to percolate, or are there specific plans to set up government structures to promote certain types of sanitation and things like that? Yeah. So, so in other words, how is this supposed yeah. to sort of yeah. It's both. I mean, um, Meyer called his uh, rural scheme the pilot project, and by that he meant he went out and selected <laughs> cities, or I'm sorry, villages in a, in districts of the of UP which he said were neither you know, rich and poor. They were sort of in between villages. He, he shied away from the really tough ones, you know, where land consolidation, for example, would create so many feuds that it just would never be able to be done. I mean, imagine when you do that field consolidation, everybody has to give up their puppy and agree to take a piece of land in return for the 19 pieces that they used to have. And it's got to be of the same general value, market-wise, you have to go through all the legal fights against that, and everybody has to sign off and agree on it and put their name on the new map. Um, so what you found, these model schemes were precisely that. They were meant to be exemplary. They were meant to be uh, kind of what could, what could be done. Model Town, I don't know why they chose that name, but I think there's that same instinct behind it. On the other hand, when you look at things like what Brain was doing, um, Brain was constantly arguing for more money. We need vans to go around to every village. We gotta have, uh, we gotta have magic lanterns. When film came along, you know, we gotta show people films that are rural characters acting out, you know, through the actions. There was a real effort to make these changes ubiquitous as well. I think pragmatically, and this is probably where my friend's critique of me of not being very good with capital. Pragmatically, it was the model scheme pilot project, the exemplary uh, milieu, that, that was what usually got built. And by the way, Frank Brain was a big name in the 1930s. Somebody wrote a really interesting essay and went back to India looking for that very village where he worked, and no one could remember him. <laughs> no one had any idea who this guy was. And, when you, and it turns out that these village um, you know, experts for the community development scheme um, they're assessed in the late 50s to see if they're making any headway. Um, almost you know, half of the village population has never even heard of the scheme. And of course, you know who's not here. They're talking mostly to the Brahmins and the villages. Um, land reform was never on the table for any of these projects. Uh, land consolidation, yes, but not land reform. Um, so, yeah, so it's, I, think it's, I think the ambitions are big, but the pragmatic, the logics of it are pretty. Um, Ex they're, 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 they're focused on exemplary schemes, pilot models. And the model is uh, incidentally something that you see in the urban discourse as well. Um, I just wanted to say several of us in the, in the audience uh, have been involved in a graduate seminar on the relationship between urban space and okay. cultural form. Uh -huh. So that's what I wanted my question to be okay. directed to you, to you about. Um, I was struck by the fact that you mentioned that your book, which I've just started looking at, disappointed those readers who are looking for some kind of affirmation of a kind of nostalgic moment in love of history, the, yeah. the, the, you know, the story of, of Manto or Muhammad Iqbal or Fez. And that raises for me a kind of interesting, I think, methodological as well as historical question. You mentioned that your story is primarily one of a kind of dialectic between colonial modernizing projects and the uh, potential agentive uh, let's say, capacity of local elites yeah. to appropriate that modernizing project for their own. That role. was the cauldron that it was formed in. Anyway. Right. 
And so my question would be, what would it take methodologically to expand your archive yeah. to include cultural production, and how might that actually impact the vision of the city that you're presenting? Mm -hmm. um, because it seems to me that the sort of the, that nostalgic investment in Lahore, which is actually, I think, not ex in, you know in any way unique to Lahore. In fact, it's about a kind of recuperating of a of a kind of colonial era cosmopolitanism, yeah, right? it's cosmopolitanism right? which is yeah, pervasive yeah, throughout yeah, much of the yeah, world, right. um, and which has to do something with notions of cultural coexistence, mm -hmm. um, you know, communitarian coexistence, yeah. the, the the sophistication of cultural production, uh, both in indigenous terms but also in response to colonial modernity. And these are all things that I think people are looking for and have somehow perceived as having been lost, most dramatically in the South Asian context because of partition, of course. But it's something that one hears when one reads books about colonial era cities, whether it's Alexandria in Egypt, or it, it, it's the same story told yeah, yeah. You know, with mutatis mutandis, with different cultural and, and socioeconomic pressures. So my question is, how, what would it take methodologically to include the, the question of culture and would that change the story you're telling, or would the material infrastructure, mm -hmm. the story of, of environmental materialism, simply continue to dictate the basic matrix of the story? It's a great question, Marcia. Um, partly, are you asking, you know, should there be more uh, vernacular literature in, in, the, in the archive? I suspect that that would be essential. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're right there. Beyond say particularly, particularly, I mean, forget the horror in a way. It's you yeah. know, that's I've said what I had to say about the horror. But mm -hmm. if you think about the rural-urban connection, you know, mm -hmm. something that that's just not be called the ambiguous journey, right, right. from the village to the city. Um, you definitely have to take on a, a literary archive and a filmic archive as well. Um, there's ambitions there that I have for that. Mm -hmm. um, I remember um, sitting in Berkeley, and I was very much caught up in that kind of cultural studies moment of, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to go out and find the experiential text that's there. We're looking for the, I'm going to go to do a project on the horn, I'm going to find Baudelaire there somewhere for damn sure, right? <laughs> and, and I went to the British Library on my way over because I could afford to be there for five or six days on my stipend <laughs> before I had to go to Daesh, yeah. where it was cheaper. And the very first thing I pulled out of the library is a book called uh, The Lahore Life. And it's written in 1902 by uh, an Arya Samaj follower. And it's, it's Baudelaire, you know? And I thought, this is going to be a piece of cake. You know? I've got, my work is, is done for me. You know, I'm going to find all kinds. So I never found anything like that. Now, it's, it's there in novels for sure. And I begin to do a lot more reading on that. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I think the, the implication of your question is for me to simply say, yes, you're right. I mean, the, the, the potential archive for a project like this is broad. I'm not the only one working on this. I don't know what it is we're doing. Mm -hmm. But what I would like to be able to do is to uh, model a kind of way of writing urban history that breaks down that kind of um, uh, dichotomy that has, of course, been animated Stuff and whatnot, and so, yeah, it's up to my capacities, I suppose. Mm -hmm. oh, you, you're working in where? Tbilisi, actually, in Georgia, in, oh, okay. in the Caucasus. Oh, yeah. But it's very interesting problems of Russian versus British models of colonial uh -huh. modernization. Is the rural urban thing there? Yes, very much. Yeah. 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 Itinerant labor from the rural countryside, from Iran. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks. We get the last question. Um, well, thank you very much. It was uh, really enriching, especially because I was born in Lahore and I grew up in Model Town. Oh, good. So, yeah, I, much <laughs> I knew you were there somewhere. <laughs> um, so I, I, I was. Just <laughs> 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 um, I was curious to know what was happening at the same time when so all of these periods that you've researched in terms of. Uh, the architecture changing, for example, from becoming traditional to more modern. It seems like a lot of this was uh, for the more affluent classes of Lahore. And so I'm curious to learn what was going on with the middle classes or the rural classes, how, uh, and also because there's a lot of migration that's happening into the city. Um, so how, how does that affect the character of the city or any research you may have done into like what their uh, spaces look like? 
There's not a lot of archival research uh, uh, evidence on that question. Um, certainly by the turn of the 20th century, you already have kachia bodies in Lahore, and that's something that comes up in sanitary reports and things like that. Um, my, my escape, methodologically, um, to that very question um, when I wrote the book was that, okay, look, this is a small minority of people. They were um, not even the most important people in the city, but they were the loudest and most vocal and left best record behind them. And so what could I do with that? Um, I think it's fair to say of Pakistan more generally, um, and this is probably my, my colleagues in the room who work on Indian cities will say, oh, that's no different. Is that the, the, you know, the, the materials for a historian to actually do kind of archival research are really in bad shape. Um, not only do we all know that you know, the underclass doesn't leave records in quite the same way that the wealthy do, um, but uh, um, the wealthy don't even leave very good records. The, one of the most um, impactful books that I've read in the last couple of years is Aman Sethi, a free man. I and mean, when you read that book, it's about a day laborer working at a cookie shop in Delhi. Um, and the guys he hangs out with, mostly guys he hangs out with. And when you read that book at the end of it, you realize that is, that is what these cities are. These cities are 80% completely unentitled, impoverished, you know, precarious lives. And, and the city that I write about is a different thing altogether. So it's, a, it's an ambition. I think um, it's a harder thing to do than it seems. But um, I hope you will do it. You seem to head it that way. You sell your place in the model town. And uh, <laughs> go to the me. <laughs> 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 <laughs>